Brief Introduction About Self-Sustaining Electrical Generator by William Barbot Basically, William Barbot's generator is a free energy generator, whose output power is greater than the input power. Power is extracted at the output and returned to the input type, creating a self-powered mechanism. William Barbot's generator is quite similar to an air core transformer, conventional transformers use specialized steel cores. The famous type of air core transformer is the Tesla coil. It is similar in appearance to a transformer, because the windings are placed side by side, but in essence does not act like a transformer. Because there isn't any vertical flux through the core of the coil. First, let's take a brief look at the generator bridge as shown in the picture below. To further expand on William Barbot's original look at the static generator, we present a version developed from William Barbot's invention, the Hubbard coil. Central sending coil. Nested output coils. The flat wire coils in series with each other were equivalent to Limer's antenna wire. They were insulated with thin enamel, so this was the only wire that allowed alpha radiation to reach the cupric oxide to ionize low mass electrons. Basic description, the generator consists of a control coil in the middle, which receives the starting voltage. In addition, there are six pairs of secondary coil, with each coil nested inside another coil. So a total of 12 secondary windings, adding one more control coil, we have 13 coils. The control coil is also called the primary coil. In order for it to have electrical oscillations, a capacitor needs to be connected. The starting can be a square voltage pulse, or an LC oscillator fed to the secondary winding. Thus, the total number of windings of the generator can be up to more than 14. The secondary windings are connected in series, to extract the output voltage, and also at this extraction site, there is a wire back to the primary winding. In electronics, it's called a feedback circuit. And after the starting process, the consuming load is connected for operation, that is, closed circuit, then the starting voltage for the system is removed. And that is the generator self-powered through the feedback circuit. William Barbot's generator is called self-sustaining electrical generator. Over Unity Electricity's comment. This is a stationary generator with high capacity, motionless electricity generator. In the world of free energy, there are many other types of high power stationary generators. Looking for more information. The motionless electricity generator by Hans Kohler. The motionless electricity generator, Hendershot generator. Electronic circuits driven by Earth's magnetic field. Practical instructions for self-powered generators with rotary motion, self-power generator. Technical drawing of self-sustaining electrical generator by William Barbot to serve for making generator. Brief description of the drawings. Fig 1, A, is a perspective view schematically depicting a sending coil in relationship to an energy magnifying coil such that inductive photons from the sending coil propagate to the energy magnifying coil. Fig 1, B, is a schematic end view of the sending coil and energy magnifying coil of Fig 1, A, further depicting radiation of inductive photons from the sending coil and respective directions of electron flow in the coils. Fig 1, C, is a schematic end view of the sending coil and energy magnifying coil of Fig 1, A, further depicting the production of inwardly radiating and outwardly radiating magnified inductive photons from the energy magnifying coil. Fig 2, A, is a perspective view schematically showing an internal output coil coaxially nested inside the energy magnifying coil to allow efficient induction of the internal output coil by the energy magnifying coil, wherein the induction current established in the internal output coil is used to power a load connected across the internal output coil. Fig 2, B, is a schematic end view of the coils shown in Fig 2, A, further depicting the greater amount of magnified inductive photon radiation that is received by the external output coil in comparison to the lesser amount that is directed toward the sending coil to act as a back force. Fig 3 is an electrical schematic diagram of a representative embodiment of a generating apparatus. This is a very important drawing, it shows the self-powered mechanism through the feedback circuit. 
the drawing shows a primary coil and a pair of secondary windings. Note that there are six pairs of secondary windings, and this is only a drawing for the principle of feedback and the mechanism between the primary and secondary windings. Self-powered generators are an integral part of free energy. And even Nikola Tesla uses a self-powered mechanism for AC generator. It is a classic invention of the time, because it has a difference from other types of generators that use a magnet to stir the ether, while other generators use the ether tension in the circuit itself. Generate electricity, or use the repulsion of magnetism. Fig 4 is a schematic end view of a representative embodiment comprising a centrally disposed sending coil surrounded by six energy magnifying coils each having an axis that is substantially parallel to the axis of the sending coil. A respective internal output coil is coaxially nested inside each energy magnifying coil, and the energy magnifying coils are arranged so as to capture substantially all the inductive photons radiating from the sending coil. Fig 5 is a schematic end view of the embodiment of Fig 4, further including an external output coil situated coaxially with the sending coil and configured to surround all six energy magnifying coils so as to capture outwardly radiating inductive photons from the energy magnifying coils. Also depicted is the greater amount of magnified inductive photon radiation that is received by the internal output coils and the external output coil in comparison to the lesser amount of inductive photon radiation that is directed toward the sending coil to act as a back force. Also shown are the arrays of LEDs used for exciting the energy magnifying coils to become photoconductive. Fig 6 is a perspective view of the embodiment of figs 4 and 5 but further depicting respective intercoil connectors for the energy magnifying and internal output coils, as well as respective leads for the sending coil, internal output coils, and external output coil. Fig 7 is a schematic head-end view schematically depicting exemplary current flow directions in the sending coil, energy magnifying coils, internal output coils, and external output coils, as well as in the various intercoil connectors, of the embodiment of Fig 4. Fig 8 is a schematic end view showing an embodiment of the manner in which intercoil connections can be made between adjacent energy magnifying coils. Fig 9, A, is a schematic end view depicting the coil configuration of an embodiment in which a sending coil and an internal output coil are nested inside an energy magnifying coil, which is in turn nested inside an exterior output coil. A metallic separator, having a substantially parabolic shape and being situated between the sending coil and the internal output coil, reflects some of the otherwise unused inductive photon radiation to maximize the effective radiation received by the energy magnifying coil. Also, the metallic shield prevents the internal output coil from receiving radiation sent from the sending coil. Fig 9, B, is a schematic end view of the coil configuration of Fig 9, A further depicting the metallic separator acting as a shield to restrict the back force radiation reaching the sending coil while allowing the internal output coil to receive a substantial portion of the magnified radiation from the energy magnifying coil. Also depicted is the greater amount of magnified inductive photon radiation that is received by the internal output coil and the external output coil in comparison to the lesser amount that is received by the sending coil to act as a back force. Fig 10, A is a schematic end view depicting the coil configuration of yet another embodiment that is similar in some respects to the embodiment of Fig 4, but also including respective ferromagnetic cores inside the sending coil and internal output coils. Also depicted is a metallic shield surrounding the entire apparatus. Detailed description, general technical considerations, to serve for making generator. An understanding of how infinite energy mistakenly came to be rejected by the scientific community clarifies the basis of this invention. The electrodynamic function described in the embodiments described later below conforms to Helmholtz's alternate energy rule, which states that a force that is not in line with its causative force may be either lost or gained ad infinitum. This rule was included in Uber Dyer Hall Tung der Kraft, on the conservation of force, that Hermann Helmholtz delivered to the Physical Society of Berlin in 1847. But, Helmholtz mistakenly believed that all actions in nature are reducible to forces of attraction and repulsion, the intensity of forces depending solely upon the distances between points involved. 
so it is impossible to obtain an unlimited amount of force capable of doing work as the result of any combination whatsoever of natural objects. Helmholtz refused to accept the idea that magnetic energy qualifies for ad infinitum status despite the fact that Ampere's 1820 magnetic force on parallel straight conductors is obviously transverse to the direction of the electric currents rather than being in line with the currents. He omitted mention that the magnetic force in Ampere's 1825 important invention, the solenoidal electromagnet, is caused by currents in the loops of his coils which are transverse to the direction of magnetic force. Also, he failed to mention that Ampere considered the magnetic force of a permanent magnet to be caused by minute transverse circular currents, which are now recognized as electrons that spin and orbit transversely. Helmholtz, who was educated as a military medical doctor without any formal study of physics, relied instead on an obsolete metaphysical explanation of magnetic force, Magnetic attraction may be deduced completely from the assumption of two fluids which attract or repel in the inverse ratio of the square of their distance. It is known that the external effects of a magnet can always be represented by a certain distribution of the magnetic fluids on its surface. Without departing from this belief in magnetic fluids, Helmholtz cited Wilhelm Weber's 1846 similarly wrong interpretation that magnetic and inductive forces are directed in the same line as that between the moving electric charges that cause the forces. Weber had thought that he could unify coulombic, magnetic, and inductive forces in a single, simple equation, but Weber's flawed magnetic force term leads to the absurd conclusion that a steady current in a straight wire induces a steady electric current in a parallel wire. Also, a changing current does not induce an electromotive force in line with the current, as Weber's equation showed. The induced force is offset instead, which becomes more apparent the further that two nested, coaxial coils are separated. What appears to be a directly opposing back force is actually a reciprocal inductive force Helmholtz's assertion that the total sum of the energy in the universe is a fixed amount that is immutable in quantity from eternity to eternity appealed to his young friends. But, the elder scientists of the Physical Society of Berlin declared his paper to be fantastical speculation and a hazardous leap into very speculative metaphysics, so it was rejected for publication in Annalen der Physik. Rather than accept this rejection constructively, Helmholtz found a printer willing to help him self-publish his work. Helmholtz headed the publication with a statement that his paper had been read before the Society, but he disingenuously withheld mention of its outright rejection. Unwary readers have since received the wrong impression that his universal energy conservation rule had received the society's endorsement rather than its censure. Helmholtz, 1862-1863, publicized his concept thusly, we have been led up to a universal natural law, which expresses a perfectly general and particularly characteristic property of all natural forces, and which is to be placed by the side of the laws of the unalterability of mass and the unalterability of the chemical elements. Helmholtz, 1881, declared that any force that did not conserve energy would be in contradiction to Newton's axiom, which established the equality of action and reaction for all natural forces sick. With this deceitful misrepresentation of Newton's strictly mechanical principle, Helmholtz had craftily succeeded in commuting the profound respect for Newton's laws to his unscientific doctrine. Subsequently, the Grand Cross was conferred on Helmholtz by the kings of Sweden and Italy and the President of the French Republic, and he was welcomed by the German Emperor into nobility with the title of Von added to his name. These prestigious awards made his doctrine virtually unassailable in the scientific community. Ampere's principle of transverse magnetic attraction and repulsion between electric currents had been made into an equation for the magnetic force between moving electric charges by Carl Frederick Gauss, written in 1835, published posthumously in 1865. The critical part of Gauss's equation shows, and modem physics texts agree, that magnetic force is transverse to the force that imparts a relative velocity, i.e., perpendicular to a connecting line between charges. Lacking a direct back force, a transverse magnetic force can produce a greater force than the force that causes it. 
The only physicist to recognize in print the profound significance of Gauss's work was James Clerk Maxwell, 1873, who stated, if Gauss's formula is correct, energy might be generated indefinitely in a finite system by physical means. Prepossessed with Helmholtz's law, Maxwell chose not to believe Gauss's transverse magnetic force equation and accepted Wilhelm Weber's, 1846, erroneous inline formula instead. Maxwell even admitted knowing of Gauss's, 1845, rebuke of Weber for his mistaken direction of magnetic force as a complete overthrow of Ampere's fundamental formula and the adoption of essentially a different one. In 1893 the critical part of Ampere's formula for magnetic force, which Weber and Maxwell rejected, and which Helmholtz had replaced with his contrary metaphysical explanation, was proposed for the basis for the international measure of electric current, the ampere, or amp, to be defined in terms of the transverse magnetic force that the current produces. But Helmholtz's doctrine had become so impervious to facts that anyone who challenged this law faced defamation and ridicule. The first recognition of unlimited energy came from Sir Joseph Larmer who reported in 1897, a single ion e, describing an elliptic orbit under an attraction to a fixed center, must rapidly lose its energy by radiation. But in the cases of steady motion it is just this amount that is needed to maintain the permanency of motion in the ether. Apparently to mollify critics of his heretical concept, Larmer offered a half-hearted recantation in 1900, the energy of orbital groups would be through time sensibly dissipated by radiation, so that such groups could not be permanent. In 1911 Rutherford found that an atom resembles a small solar system with negative ions moving like planets around a small, positively charged nucleus. These endlessly orbiting electrons were a source of the perpetual radiation that had been aptly described by Larmer, and these orbiting electrons were also Planck's, 1911, harmonic oscillators that he used to explain zero-point energy, ZPE. ZPE was shown by the fact that helium remains liquid under atmospheric pressure at absolute zero, so that helium must be pressurized to become solid at that temperature. Planck believed that harmonic oscillators derive dark energy from the ether to sustain their oscillations, thereby admitting that an infinite source of energy exists. However, he assigned an occult origin to this infinite energy rather than a conventional source that had not met with Helmholtz's approval. Niels Bohr, 1924, was bothered by the notion that radiation from an orbiting electron would quickly drain its energy so that the electron should spiral into the nucleus. Whitaker, 1951, states, Bohr and associates abandoned the principle that an atom which is emitting or absorbing radiation must be losing or gaining energy. In its place they introduced the notion of virtual radiation, which was propagated in waves but which does not transmit energy or momentum. Subsequently the entire scientific community dismissed Larmer radiation as a source of real energy because it failed to conform to Helmholtz's universally accepted doctrine. Helmholtz's constraining idea that the vast amount of light and heat radiating from the many billions of stars in the universe can only come from previously stored energy has led scientists to concur that fusion of pre-existing hydrogen to helium supplies nearly all the energy that causes light and heat to radiate from the sun and other stars. If so, then the entire universe will become completely dark after the present hydrogen supply in stars is consumed in about 20 billion years. William A. Fowler 1965, believed that essentially all the hydrogen in the universe emerged 